For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Mudli. Joining me today is award-winning journalist and inner city activist, Nicholas Bauer, here to discuss his book, Great Johannesburg, What Happened? How to Save an African Economic Giant. So your book, Great Johannesburg, asks the question, is the city of gold in a death spiral? And to answer this, you lay out the city's history and the issues that affect residents today. So why was it so important for you to put pen to paper on this specific topic? Well, as a born bred Joe Berger, it's been very, very difficult for me to talk about Johannesburg in the way that I have, but uh, it needs to be discussed. I mean, the, I don't think it's merely a question about whether or not the city is in a death spiral. We're in the death throes of a death spiral. It's uh, pretty much coming to absolute rock bottom for the city of gold. And I thought that as a committed Joe Berger that's you know, reported on the city for almost two decades, uh, as a social impact entrepreneur in the inner city, as well as a former civil servant in Johannesburg, I had a pretty unique perspective about where the city was, where it's going, and and also the unique opportunities that, that we're faced with. Because while Johannesburg is in serious trouble, there's nothing wrong with the city that can't be fixed with what's right. And and this is what this book is about, really. It's about trying to illustrate to Joburgers how they can make a difference in their own corner of the city. I mean, you look at the problems that the, the city is facing, it's very easy to get filled with despair and just give up and start looking elsewhere, whether or not it's a semigration to Cape Town or elsewhere in the world. But Joe Burgers, every single one of us need to realize that we, we can't give up on the city of gold. It's, it's, it's not yet time to throw in the towel. And your book lays out Johannesburg's history, you know, the gold rush and influx of migrants into the city, the context of crime, you know, and apartheid laws. And you say in your book that it's naive to think that the city's current state is divorced from its history. And before we get into some of the issues that are affecting the city, what do you say to those people who argue that the past is the past and the city's issues today are not related to the past? Well, I think that that's in itself, uh, a statement that's divorced from reality. Uh, I think people that don't understand history, regardless of what context, whether or not it's Johannesburg, South Africa, or the world today, uh, is in for a rude awakening when history starts to not necessarily repeat itself, but rhyme. And I mean, all of Johannesburg's current problems can be contextualized through the past. And it's not about bringing up apartheid and blaming apartheid. It's about understanding what the city is. Johannesburg is not Paris. Johannesburg is not Cape Town. Johannesburg is not New York or Moscow. Johannesburg is a city of gold that's been formed through a number of migrations over the years. It's still fairly young in an international context. It's less than 150 years old. And it's deeply unnatural. It's the biggest city in the world that was formed without a water source, not near a coastline. And it's facing unique challenges, but not challenges that are insurmountable. And to hammer my point home, if we don't understand where these challenges come from, how they've manifested themselves over uh, 14 decades of the city's history, then we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes again and again and again. A very simple example, xenophobia. That's not a new thing. Xenophobia first appeared on the scene in Johannesburg with the discovery of gold. Uh, and the Zuid-Afrikaner Republic headed by Paul Kruger talking about us and them, the ungodly Eightlanders that were coming to really take advantage of uh, the precious metals below the, the earth. So, I mean, I, I understand that there's a very fashionable thing to point the finger at anybody who wants to bring up the history nowadays. Uh, and people get very uh, spirited about any discussion that relates back to our recent apartheid history. But uh, this book is about contextualizing where these problems come from, what we can do about them, and taking a very sober look at but where, where is Johannesburg in the context of South Africa after its 140-year something history. And you mentioned xenophobia, and your book, you know, traces xenophobia following migrants, you know, coming into the city. Your book also says, though, that the city faces a choice to transform xenophobia and fear into acceptance and opportunity. Can you give us just a few examples of how this could be accomplished? Let's look at any great society on Earth, uh, whether or not it's the United States of America, even China to a lesser extent. Migration has been a big part of their history, a big part of their story itself, uh, and the ability to relate to other nations through an understanding of what it is to be more than just where you come from. 
uh, and where you're going to. And also, indeed, the importance of acceptance and diplomacy. Again, I'm going to refer back to Johannesburg's history. Johannesburg would not have existed were it not for migration. Uh, I'm a product of migrants. My father, uh, late father, came from Austria. He was part of the, the great migration into South Africa in the 70s. Uh, my mother is from Zambia, another Southern African uh, migrant. Uh, and we can't run away from the fact that people are coming to South Africa because it's still largely seen as the land of opportunity on the African continent. And indeed, for people elsewhere in the world. We're not going to stop that by building higher walls or arming people at the border posts with, uh, in order to, to shoot to kill. People will still keep on coming. We've seen this all over the world. So my idea is a practical way that we can benefit from this is incentivize existing immigrants to become part of the system, to become taxpayers, to become not only valuable members of society that they are at this point in time by creating jobs and pursuing enterprise, but give them a path to citizenship so that they can genuinely and legitimately add to not only the, the tax purse, but indeed other sectors of South African society. Why don't we look at migrant enclaves like Yeovil and Hilbrow and try and harness the enterprise, try and harness the innovation that is unfolding on the streets and in, in, in small scale enterprises and companies in those areas, instead of condemning them as places where we shouldn't even bother going because they're now migrant enclaves and taken up by non-South Africans. I think that's an extremely short-sighted view. And, you know, by incentivizing a path to citizenship, a path to regularizing your stay in South Africa. We can incentivize others that are here illegally uh, to regularize their stay and become taxpayers. And those that, that don't want to, well, then, of course, you know, there must be carrot uh, with stick uh, as well. And, you know, people that don't want to regularize their stay, indeed, in Johannesburg or in South Africa must face the consequences. But migration would be far more orderly if there was a route to migration that genuine migrants could be able to pursue. Now, despite apartheid laws being dismantled, your book points to the city's design and development perpetuating the segregation legacy. Can you briefly unpack this? Well, you know, apartheid ceased to exist in 1993 from a legislative perspective. Look around at any big city in South Africa, you're faced with the main city and townships around it that have continued to grow uh, in terms of informal settlements, to grow uh, in terms of inequality. This is not something that can be run away from when it comes to legislation. And Johannesburg is a prime example of this as well. The city's tried to counter the apartheid blueprint in Johannesburg with things like the Corridors of Freedom Project. But that has been stifled by vested interests, whether or not it's not in my backyard groupings from Norwood to Santon, uh, and indeed even uh, Bramley uh, to uh, Bramfontein, but also like uh, the taxi industry, uh, frustrating things like the uh, bus rapid transport system that has really become a white elephant in the city of Johannesburg. The apartheid spatial planning that South Africa continues to suffer from is not going to be wished away. We need to grapple with these very real realities. And the moment we start to grapple with those realities, we can do something about them. Johannesburg is no different. And, and I think the easiest way to counter something like the apartheid blueprint in the city of, of gold is to pursue things like walkability. You know, any great city in the world in contemporary history, the past 30 years or so, has pursued an aspect of transport and of course, also uh, ability to walk the streets safely and to do so uh, to get to work, to get back home, to, to actually experience the city by foot in a way that we actually begin to grapple with what the city is. Because if you look around with a huge big urban sprawl like uh, Johannesburg has, you know, it makes sense that people have cars. People need a car to get from Rudiput to Santon if that's their daily commute or Soweto to Rosebank. But why are we jumping in a car to travel 200 meters to a petrol station to buy a chocolate and a packet of cigarettes? Why are we not walking? Why are we not engaging with the world around us instead of staying behind our high walls with electric fencing and big dogs and trying to fortify ourselves from the problems that are just outside our door? And your book also says it is a misconception that the city is not suitable for walkers. 
Well, I, I would argue that it's plain to see, you know, we say it's not suitable for walkers because perhaps we have a car and we have a way to opt out of it. But there's hundreds of thousands of Joe Burgers that are walking every single day. I, I think it's an extremely myopic and, and really partisan way of looking at things saying Johannesburg's not walk suitable. Well, it's not walk suitable because you've chosen to, uh, you know, join a carpool or use your own car or, uh, or use other modes of transport. But people that can't afford that are already hitting the streets as we speak. And the more people do that, I think that we start to begin to grapple with the true challenges of Johannesburg. People may listen to that and think that I'm being partisan in my own right, uh, you know, with uh, Lala and Jay, my social enterprise, offering walking tours in Hillbrow, for instance. But it's not about walking in the center of Johannesburg and being scared about just walking from Bramfontein's car train station to Conhill and worrying about being mugged. It's about walking around in your suburb and grappling with the immediate community around you. That's also making the city walkable. The you know, places like Melville, for instance, uh, a place that I like to call home. Why are people not walking more? I mean, I would argue that the more people walk and the more people make Melville pedestrian friendly, the safer it will become. At this point in time, there is a safety concern. People are being mugged. People are being attacked for their belongings. But the more people don't see the streets as off limits, except for those that absolutely have to use them, the more we'll be able to, in a sense, take our streets back and make Johannesburg safer from a walkable perspective. And lastly, Nicholas, your book tackles various other issues such as crime, racism, corruption, and governance, all of which you know directly affect Joe Burgers. And in your book, you issue a clarion call to residents who you describe as the city's true resource. What do you want people living in the city of gold to ultimately take away from this book? The point that I really want to hit home with Great Johannesburg is that 40% of all the world's gold came out of the ground in Johannesburg. Imagine that. Almost half of all the gold in the history of the world came out from below the earth in the city of gold, Johannesburg. The majority of that precious resource is gone. It's gone. But now the true resource that remains is its people. And the people of Johannesburg might just save the city because from a governance perspective, we've really seen the proof time and time again with multiple administrations failing to live up to any expectations whatsoever. So I think the mantle falls to the people of Johannesburg. And that can be started in your own corner of the city. You may look at the city's challenges and think, what can I do? What can my one household do? But I draw on my own perspective when I was a civil servant in 2022 in the city of Johannesburg working in the EISD department. It sounds like a mouthful, the infrastructure and environmental services department, but essentially it was the department in charge of city power, Joburg water, and pick it up. All of those sexy service delivery departments. And when I engage with those communities, whether or not it was a safety and security issue, a service delivery issue from power, water supply, refuse removal, it was time and time again, the communities that were engaged, that went beyond knowing who their counselor was, but got to know who were working for the different entities in that specific region, your city powers, your Joburg waters, your pick it up and actually engaged, rolled up their sleeves and engaged with the problems on the ground in Johannesburg, they always had better service delivery outcomes. And that is my clarion call to every single Joe Burger, that you can make a difference. Don't just give in to the prophets of doom and think that Joe is done and dusted. Of course, we need legislative input and we need things to turn around from a governance point of view. We can, of course, hold our uh, politicians accountable come election time and and, you know, things like Zama Zamas are not going to be dealt with uh, by private individuals. You know, we need a legislative overhaul. Why are we not dishing out artisanal mining licenses and trying to deal with the problem from that point of view? That needs to happen from a governance perspective. But in your own corner of Johannesburg, why are you not joining hands with other Joburgers on your street, in your neighborhood, and trying to see how you can address your issues in your suburb? I'll leave you with this one final thought. The Wilds is a botanical oasis in the center of Johannesburg, bordering Houghton, Hillbrow, and Kalani. Ten years ago, it was a no-go area. It took one Joburger, James Delaney, to turn that around, to decide that he was 
not going to give in to the prophets of doom and just accept that being a no-go area for safety and security reasons, he decided to go in there with his dog. And within months, he was joined by others. He was joined by schools in the area that also wanted to turn the place into a public space again. You enter the wilds today, it is a botanical oasis in the middle of one of the craziest cities in the world. You might think that you're in the Kruger Park when you walk through the wilds. And to me, that is all the proof we need to show that one Joburger turns into two Joburgers, turns into five Joburgers, and before you know it, you have so many people around you walking shoulder to shoulder to turn the city around, and that's what needs to happen in the city of gold. That was award-winning journalist and inner-city activist Nicholas Bauer here to discuss his book, Great Johannesburg.